Hey everyone, welcome to Midweek at the Compass. My name's Jake, I'm our Three Rivers campus pastor and our online pastor. And you're joining us with our sermon series about deconstruction. And because of that, our midweek conversations are generally talking about the same things, except for this week. This week, I wanna prime the pump to be able to talk about who is joining us starting next week. You see, next week, we're gonna be joined by a gentleman who works for InterVarsity. His name is Greg Howe. He's the Executive Vice President of Communication and Mobilization. You might recognize Greg. He's been on a previous iteration of Midweek. But to get you more familiar with him and where our conversations are gonna go next week, Greg actually joined us this last summer for Summer at the Compass. But he only spoke to just a couple of our in-person services. So all of us here, through our online ministry, didn't get to hear the wonderful message that he shared. So to get you ready for what we're going to talk about next week, let's join our Summer at the Compass series at our Naperville campus and listen in to the message that Greg delivered then. I work in campus ministry, as Jeff mentioned, and so for me, New Year's is August. Right now, whatever, January is mid-year. What happens for me is the beginning of the school year is filled with potential. And if you have kids, and I suspect some of you do, and you're thinking, school could not start soon enough. Summer break is really long. But, right, um, the beginning of every school year is filled with potential because in campus ministry, it's the chance to meet new students. Millions of college students are coming to the university campus, and we get an opportunity to meet them and introduce some of them to Jesus. We get an opportunity to welcome church kids and kids from Young Life and Youth for Christ and say, you can follow Jesus. Here at university, God has brought you here to be missionaries, to be salt and light in this place. The new year always begins with new things for me. And so my excitement level begins to climb as soon as we get near August because all of a sudden everything is new and we get to start all over. And I'm so grateful that there's this yearly pattern because my, in my heart of hearts, I long for something new to be happening. Do you? I long for something new to happen in our world. When I read the newspapers and I hear of children perishing because of floods in Kentucky, children dying of famine in parts of Africa, children dying, right, in the wars that are all over the world, I just think, Lord, do something new. When I look at my community, I long for the Lord to do something new. I hear stories of students who can't afford basic necessities for them to get to school here in the suburbs, and I think that shouldn't be the way it is. I think of families that are breaking up all around me in my neighborhood, and I think, Lord, this isn't what you want. Do something new. I think of my own family and the struggles that we have with health issues on the one hand and faith crises on the other, strained marriages in multiple places. I think, Lord, would you do something new? I don't know if you feel that way today coming here, but I have to believe that if you are a church that worships as wholeheartedly and whole bodily as you just did, that a part of you is thinking, Lord, would you do something new? Would you do something new in me? Would you do something new in my family, in my community, in my world? I want to see you work. And the question that we need to ask is, how and when does the Lord begin to do a new thing? When does he intervene in such a way that something new begins to happen? The text I want to look at today is Nehemiah chapter 1. If you have your Bibles in front of you in the pew, you're welcome to turn to that. In the flow of salvation history, Nehemiah occurs at this moment, right? The Lord rescues the people of Israel out of Egypt, establishes them in a new land, establishes a kingdom under David and his heirs, and because of sin, apostasy, and unfaithfulness, God sends them into exile. But he promises that he will bring them back and that one day he will return to demonstrate that he dwells in Jerusalem and the nations will come to worship there. And we're at the point where the people of Israel have come back to Israel. They've rebuilt the temple, which is where Jeff will pick up the series next week. And a few years later is when Nehemiah's story picks up. 
When does God begin to do a new thing? Nehemiah chapter 1 answers that question. When does God desire a new thing? I think in part God desires and intends and begins a new thing when we, his people, decide that we are all in. When mind, heart, and soul, we throw ourselves into what God is doing. That's a little bit of what Paul was getting at when he was trying to help us think about different worship postures, that it's not just something that we do with our mouths or in our heads or in our hearts, but our whole being is engaged in what God is doing amidst, whether in celebration or in the case of Nehemiah, in the midst of pain and tragedy. Because I think God first begins to do a new thing when our minds are thoroughly informed by reality. Look at what happens for Nehemiah in verses 1 and 2. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Halakiah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, when I was at the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. What's fascinating to me is that while Nehemiah is living at the citadel, he chooses to ask for information that disturbs him. What was the citadel of Susa? The citadel of Susa was the summer capital of the Persian Empire. It was its political center. It was its seat of greatest affluence. It was its military um, core. To translate it into modern day, this would be if New York City, Washington, D.C., and some enormous military installation was all in one place. And Nehemiah says, I was there at the center. I was at the safest most affluent, most influential place that there could be in that part of the known world. And while he's living there in great security, Nehemiah says, I heard people came from Jerusalem and I sought them out. And I asked them, what is happening out there? What is going on with our people and the city where our forefathers were buried? I deeply appreciate how Nehemiah approaches this because it would have been so easy to live in his comfortable bubble at Susa, wouldn't it? When you're at the political, military, and economic capital of the Persian Empire, what do you care about something that's happening so far away in Jerusalem? When you've made it, what do you care about what's going on over there? When all of your needs are taken care of, and all of your desires are being met, why trouble yourself with what's going on over there? But Nehemiah chooses to press in and to say, tell me what's happening. Give me some information that might potentially disturb me. There's a great great danger, I think, for us as a church in choosing to insulate ourselves in citadels where we might be safe. In fact, For many of us, that's why we live where we do, if we're honest, don't we? We've chosen the communities that that we live in now because they're safe. We know our children will be safe. They're going to go to good schools. We're there again to get good jobs. It's safe. That's one of the biggest selling points of the suburbs. I remember when we moved from New York City back here to the western suburbs, I told my kids, get on your bike and ride around the block. And their eyes got really wide, and they said, by ourselves? And I said, yes, that's what it means to live in the suburbs. And so they rode their bikes around the block. They were in third and fifth grade at the time. They'd never done that before. And they said, Papa, it was so strange. All these old people kept saying hello to us. What were we supposed to do? (laughs) And I said, in the suburbs, you wave and you say hi back. But right, that's why we choose to live in a safe place. And we send them to good schools so that they can go to better schools when they graduate and then they can get a good job to ensure that they and their children also live in a safe place. And the challenge is when we choose to live in safe places, it insulates us from all the information that God might want to give us about the world that God loves. It's doubly true given the way that social media works today, isn't it? Back when I was young, remember we all used to watch the same three channels. Maybe fourth if you were a big PBS fan. (laughs) And we all received about the same news. And we didn't have a lot of choice about what news we were going to watch, and they were pretty indistinguishable from each other. But now, given social media and the proliferation of cable channels, you can choose the news you want to watch. You can choose news that comforts you, that confirms what you already believe and know, and doesn't disturb you in ways that you don't want to be disturbed by. 
We can narrow our world to podcasts that lift us up and encourage us. We can live in a little bubble that's like a citadel. And what happens is I think we become removed from the actual world that God loves. I was at the Chicago Cultural Center a few years back. It's on Randolph in Michigan, and they had this art exhibit. It was uh, photographs by a Brazilian photographer named Sebastiel Salgado. And Sebastiel Salgado has made it his <clears throat> mission in life to capture moments of humanity's deep need. And in this case, it was a photo exhibit of the Rwandan genocide. He was one of the first people back on the ground there from um, outside of Rwanda. And honestly, it was just photograph after photograph of corpses, of children whose bodies were being sheltered by their mothers and then being killed, right? Of um, just masses of bodies everywhere. And as I watched this exhibit, you know, picture after picture after picture, I, I was just silent and wrestling with what to say to God. And this young couple then walked past me, and I remember this young man looked at these pictures and he said, oh, unreal. And then there's something in my heart just leapt up. I wanted to take him and shake him and go, this is not unreal. This is very real. This happens all of the time. This happens in multiple places. This isn't unreal. This is part of the reality we live in. And what kind of world do I live in that somebody can look at this and go, unreal, when it's so painfully real? But Nehemiah chooses to break through. And even though he's at the citadel of Susa, he asks, what's going on in Jerusalem with our people and the city of our God? And when he hears what happens... His heart is thoroughly broken because I believe that God begins to do a new thing when we allow not only our minds to be informed, but our hearts to be broken by what's happening in the world. Look at what happens in verses 3 and 4. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I love the fact that Nehemiah doesn't just take the information and then compartmentalize it and go, oh, that's so bad that it's happening over there. Or that he doesn't dismiss it by going, well, you know, that's what happens to those people when they rebel against the king so constantly. Or minimize it by going, well, you know, the political situation means that this is what's going to happen to Jerusalem at the time. Nehemiah takes it in and then allows it to break his heart. His heart's soft and it's vulnerable to the plight of God's world, which is filled with the people that God loves. And so that he mourns and he fasts and he prays, not just for like a half an hour, then goes, oh, you know, I really need a worship song to cheer me up right now. Or not after just half a day and like, oh, if there's just a devotional that could lift me up, but for days he allows his heart to be grieving. For days he allows his heart to be soft. For days he allows himself to be affected by people that are distant from him. God begins to do a new thing when we allow our hearts to be soft. But it's hard for us, isn't it? I helped plant a church um, about a decade or two ago, and it was a small Asian American church, and so, like so many Asian American church, after service, we went out to eat lunch. If you ever need a free meal, I invite you to an Asian church, usually around lunchtime, there's food served somewhere. And so, we were off eating at a bone of beef, uh, the one actually on Butterfield near, near Finley. And um, I had just put a sandwich in my mouth when my friend Jane, who was sitting across from me, said, you know, Greg, it always bums me out every time I see you come up for prayer. And then she put the sandwich in her mouth and began to chew. <laughs> and I looked at her because this, I'll be honest, is not the response I hope for when I come up to preach or to pray that people are immediately bummed out. I didn't know what to say, so I chewed on my Italian beef sandwich for just a little bit longer, and I finally said, so, Ina, um, why? Why, why? Why do I bum you out when you see me come up to pray? And she looked at me, and she said, you know, I come to church exhausted, right? It's been a long week at work. Work is hard right now. And my family situation is difficult. And I'm discouraged, tired, and I'm just looking for inspiration, hope, and encouragement for a week when I come to worship. And I'm lifted up by the worship music, and then I see you come up to the podium, and you pray this prayer. 
She said, for week after week, you say things like, Lord, during this 90 minutes of worship, we know that nine people attempt to commit suicide and succeed today. That 500 children will die of famine. That 352 people will contract HIV AIDS. And you go on and on and on. You bum me out when you pray, Greg. And then she took another bite of her sandwich. I didn't know what to say to her, so I grabbed a fry and began to chew on it slowly. (laughs) Food is great for buying you time. And I said, you know, Jane, the reason I pray these prayers is this. I, I work in campus ministry, and regularly my students are told that Karl Marx is right, that religion is just the opiate of the masses. You worship God so that you could ignore the world's pain. People are using it to control you and make you subservient and complacent and comfortable. And I have to figure out how to respond to that challenge. And I think, can I sing about the Lord's love and compassion and goodness and ignore the world's pain and the world's hurt? I don't think so, because if, I, if, if singing about God's goodness causes me not to realize that these things are true, then Marx was really right. I'm using this just as a self-help tool, a psychological pick-me-up at the beginning of the week. But if I can sing, I believe that the Lord is good and he's turned my life around and intends to turn the life of the world around and simultaneously see the lostness of the people around me. If I can sing about the Lord's goodness and faithfulness and generosity at the same time realizing that there are thousands of people who are going to perish today from preventable causes, if I can live with those intentions, then I can worship with integrity. And I can invite students to come follow Jesus believing that they can bring their whole selves, including their minds, hearts, and souls into this, that I'm not deceiving them or deluding them. Because if I can't sing that and think of that at the same time, then I'm not really worshiping a God who's engaged with the world that he claims to be. How does God begin to do a new thing? He begins in part when our minds are thoroughly saturated by reality, when our hearts are broken by the brokenness of the world. And then I think God begins to do a new thing when our souls reject the status quo. When our hearts, as we take in this information, our hearts are broken, we just go to God and go, this is not how it's supposed to be. Right? I don't know if you feel that way, but I have several friends right now who have terminal cancer, and I just think, Lord, this is not how it's supposed to be. I know several friends whose marriages are on the rocks. They're hanging on by a thread right now, just out of discipline. I just think, Lord, this is not what you intend for them. My my wife works with HIV AIDS issues around the world, and I just hear story after story nearly every night of people who are perishing for foolish, unnecessary reasons because there are resources and technology available to help them. I go, Lord, this is not what you intended for your people. I look at the brokenness of the church around me. It's failure to address simple issues of righteousness and holiness. I go, Lord, this is not what you intend. And I think when our souls are outraged by the status quo, God begins to do a new thing. And that's what troubled Nehemiah. Because he says the walls of Jerusalem are in disarray. And for most of us, we don't care about walls very much. We don't live in cities with walls. I mean, some of you might live in communities with walls, but they don't mean very much at this point. But if you were a city in the ancient Near East without walls, it meant you weren't a city worth worrying about. You were a two-bit or three-bit city at that point. You weren't worth defending. You weren't worth attacking. You weren't worth noticing, right? In the modern-day equivalent, if you didn't have walls, you didn't have a Starbucks, And Nehemiah is outraged because God had said, at Jerusalem will be the place where my king dwells and I will establish his throne forever and it's now a city without walls. God had said, I will cause my glory to dwell in my temple and now it's a city without walls. I will make Jerusalem the place where the nations come in to hear my law and to have the law inscribed on their heart. And now it's a city without walls, which meant it was a city without respect, which meant it was a city ruled over by a God who had no power and no authority over the gods around him. Nehemiah is outraged by what is going on. 
And I wonder if as we look at the world and we see that God's glory is not recognized, that his name is not praised, that Jesus' name is not honored, respected, and submitted to, do we have a similar sense of outrage? When we see the world writhing and broken in sin rather than being joyful at receiving and experiencing the righteousness and generosity of God, are our hearts broken and our souls so bothered that we do the only thing that we can do, which is turn to God in prayer. And that's exactly where Nehemiah goes. He goes, this is not the world you intended and this is not how it's supposed to be, so I must pray. How does God begin a new thing? It's not only when our whole bodies and minds and souls are engaged with the brokenness of the world. It begins when we pray and our prayers are thoroughly saturated with the knowledge of God. Look at how Nehemiah prays in verses 5 through 11. Nehemiah points out three things that he knows. The first is he knows something about God's attributes, the very nature of the God that he worships. And he says, I know that you're powerful, that you're loving, and that you're holy, and that has consequences. Look at verses 5 through 7. Then I prayed, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenants of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant, Moses. Do you notice how he first says, what kind of God are you? I know that you're powerful. You're the great and almighty God. The God of heaven, I know that you are loving because you keep your covenants of love with those who love you and keep your commandments. And I know that you're holy and that we've fallen short right? It's a really comprehensive picture of God. You're powerful, you're loving, and you're holy. Then he says, I know not only what kind of God you are, I know your character as well. You're faithful to what you say. You're faithful to fulfill your promises, and you'll be faithful to yourself. Look at how he prays then in verses 8 and 9. Remember the instruction that you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to a place that I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. He goes, I know that you said this to us. And you said, if we are unfaithful, I will send you into exile. And you did. And you said, if we turned to you and repented, you'd bring us back. And you did. I know you are faithful to your promises. I know you will do what you say. I know that you're trustworthy. I know I can trust you. I know what kind of God you are, powerful, loving, and holy. I know that you're faithful to what you say and the promises that you've made. Then he says, I know something of your purposes too, Lord. You're jealous for your own glory. Look at verse 10. Lord, The people in Israel, they're your servants and your people who you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Do you notice what Nehemiah doesn't say? Nehemiah doesn't focus on the worth of the people that he's praying for in Jerusalem. He's not like, Lord, they're really deserving. You owe it to them to do something. He doesn't talk about how pitiful they are, though they're in a pitiful state right now without walls. Lord, you know, they're desperate. They have nothing else. What Nehemiah does is he focuses on the Lord's purposes and the Lord's actions and the Lord's desires, right? These are your people that you redeemed. You redeemed them out of Egypt with your outstretched arm and your mighty hand. You brought them into the land and you established a kingdom. You sent them into exile and you brought them back. You have a purpose for them, Lord. These are your people. These are your servants in your city where your name is supposed to be glorified. So would you do something here? And Nehemiah brings all three of these into focus because when you know the kind of God you worship and you know something about his character and you know his purposes, you can pray boldly and with power. I'm convinced powerful prayer has nothing to do with personality. 
It has nothing to do with performance, but sometimes you go, oh, they're a person of powerful prayer. They're pounding the table and they're crying out to God. It has nothing to do with that. The power of prayer is the power of the God to whom we pray. No matter how weak, how timid, how quiet we may be, power in prayer is not because we've motivated ourselves into a religious froth. It's because we know the kind of God that we worship. And Nehemiah knows the God that he prays to. We know that God is powerful because why else would you bother to pray to a God who is impotent? And we know that he's loving. Why would you pray to a God who doesn't care? And we know that he's faithful because why would you pray to a capricious, erratic God who'd say like, well, I know I promised it, but I'm not doing that today. Or I could do it, but I have no intention to do it. And why would you pray except that you know God's purposes because you know God desires this himself. And when all those align, Lord, I know that you're powerful and you can do it. I know that you love and you want to do it. I know that you're faithful and therefore intend to do it. And it fulfills your own purposes for the world, which you have already described in Scripture. So this is actually the goal that you were working toward. Then suddenly you're saying, Lord, I don't need to convince you this is what you yourself desire to do for your own glory and namesake. And at that point, I think, intercession bursts forth from Nehemiah. Look at verse 11. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayers of this your servant and to the prayers of your servants who delight in revering your name. Grant your servant success today in the presence of this man. Nehemiah is almost demanding, pay attention to this prayer, Lord, because it's what you yourself want and what you yourself desire. The old um, religious community would have said, that's importunity. Isn't that a great word, importunity? It means the boldness and courage to almost demand that God act, to be the persistent one that's like, I know you want this. To be the person who begs, not out of desperation, but out of confidence that God will act, importunity. And Nehemiah so clearly believes that his prayer is grounded in God's person, in God's character, in God's purposes, that he is fearless in asking for what he needs. That's why I think um, boring prayer meetings are such a tragedy. I mean, you are going to the Lord of the universe, hope of the world, saying, I know what you want and I know what you're like and this is a problem I know you want to fix. Lord, would you do something about it? We don't have to be tentative. We don't have to be fearful. We just have to be bold and confident because we know the God to whom we pray. <clears throat> We're meeting with the Lord of the universe and the hope of the world. And we say, we know what you're about, and would you do something about this? It's a little bit like rubber bands, is how I often think about it. That, you know, the rubber band, there's a little bit more energy the greater the distance between the two parts. <clears throat> and when I think about, like, you know, I know people who are perishing. Oh, Jesus, they're lost and they're broken. And I, yet, I know that God desires to save. That he's says, right, he desires that none perish, but everybody come to have eternal life. And the distance between the two just allows prayer to kind of pop out. And you begin to pray with greater boldness. I know that when God created the universe, he wanted people to flourish and to experience goodness and sufficiency in harmonious relationships of incredible diversity. And I see the brokenness of the world with sin and racism and poverty. And I just think, Lord, do something. Prayer doesn't then become something that we have to drag out of ourselves. It bursts forth. And Nehemiah says, Lord, give me favor in the eyes of this man. God begins a new thing when our hearts, minds, and souls are thoroughly engaged, when we pray to a God that we know, and God begins a new thing when we consider our own unique placement in the world. Nehemiah says at the end of verse 11, I was the cupbearer to the king, and I suspect some of you are thinking, why does it matter that you're a waiter, Nehemiah? What is God going to do with that? But the cupbearer to the king was the person the king trusted to make sure that his food wasn't poisoned. Because, you know, it could be a political enemy, it could be your son, it could be your brother or uncle who wanted to poison you and take the kingship. So <clears throat> the cupbearer was the one who was in charge of making sure that you weren't poisoned, usually by tasting everything before it got to you. In order to be a good anti-poisoner, you also had to be a good supply chain manager because you had to manage from farm to table what was going to get to the king's mouth. In order to do the job well, you also had to run the intelligence service, sufficiently know who the king's enemies were and where they might try to infiltrate your operation. In order to be a good cupbearer to the king, you had to be so trusted by the king that they would say, I give my security to you. 
To be cupbearer to the king meant you were somebody the king was intimate with, trusted, and somebody that the king might choose to let you do something new in God's name. Nehemiah wasn't there by accident. God had placed him there. And I wonder how it's true for you all as well. I'm convinced that not a single one of you is in a job, in a neighborhood, in a PTA community, in a family by accident. God's put you there. You may not be the cupbearer to the king where you can do geopolitical acts that will change the course of history, but you're in a place where you might be able to ask the question, what does it mean not just to work well, but to do good work here at my workplace? You might be at a place where you could say, that child seems sad day after day. Let me engage with them and offer them a kind word and be attentive to their needs. It might be, you know, nobody's seen that my neighbor come out of their house for two days. Maybe I should just stop by and ask if they're okay. You might be at a place, though, where you can actually say, you know, the products that our company makes actually do not bring about human flourishing but are a waste of money. What could we do instead? You might be at a place which could say, we have resources that could serve somebody besides the people who already have so many resources and begin to redirect those. Why has God brought you where you are? God has not placed you in a workplace, community, home, neighborhood, or family by accident. If you are a follower of Jesus today, he's brought you there because he intends for you to be salt and light. And in fact, the way you might be able to determine what you need to do is to allow your mind to be informed and your heart to break and your soul outraged, to begin to align your prayers around the very character, attributes, and purposes of God, and then to go, Lord, you brought me here. What do you want me to do? It's how actually I ended up at this job. Um, I'm one of those model minority kids. Um, 21 of my cousins, aunts, uncles, and in-laws are doctors right now. I was going to be a doctor, but then God waylaid me while I was in the university chapter at the University of Chicago. I was um, a third, second year student, going to be my third year when the nominating committee of the chapter came to me and said, Greg, we want you to consider being president of the chapter of university here at U of C. And they said, but before you say yes, you need to know two things. Um, one, you weren't our first choice. <laughs> second, you weren't even our second choice. You're our third choice, but the other two people have said no. And I thought, wow, that's an endorsement. And they said, before you say yes, we want you to take some time to pray. And I thought, you don't have time for me to pray. You need me to say yes. You've run out of people, I think. <laughs> but I decided to pray, and I went to the main gate at University of Chicago, Cobb Gate, and I used to just pray for people as they'd walk through. I didn't walk up to them and offer to pray for them. That would have creeped them out. I just prayed for them as they walked past, and I thought, that student who I know wakes up with a different person every weekend, rather than being judgmental, I thought, Lord, what level of loneliness and brokenness causes them to live a life where they don't know who they wake up with every weekend? I saw professors who I thought were in charge of my life and can control my destiny. I thought, what terror are they feeling right now because they aren't sure they're going to get tenure or they aren't going to get a grant that will allow them to pursue their research? I saw administrators walk past and I thought, I don't even see them or know them, but they make the entire university run and they're just cogs in the wheel to me. What hurts and hopes do they ex believe and experience that I pay no attention to as a student because I think they exist to serve me? And my heart was broken. My soul was outraged. And lo and behold, I'm now a professional Christian with InterVarsity for 27 years. It doesn't take a lot. It just requires us to pay attention, to allow our hearts to be broken, our souls softened and outraged, and to pray prayers that go, Lord, why did you bring me here and what do you want me to do? And if we were to do that, Compass Church, then we'd begin to see God doing a new thing. Let's pray. Lord, you're great and you love this world and you love the people of this world and you created the church to accomplish your mission in the world which is to call people to follow Jesus and then to express your love and righteousness among the people, ideas, systems, and structures of the world until everybody experiences your goodness and your holiness. 
Would you do this for your own name's sake? We pray in Christ's name, amen. I hope you enjoyed that message with Greg as much as I did because we are gonna use that particular message as our springboard into next week. Because when do we see God do a new thing? We see it when we are fully informed of a new reality and when our hearts are broken by it. We are gonna focus in on deconstruction that we see through college and young adult people in our midst. So let's have that conversation with Greg next week. We hope you will join us here at Midweek at the Compass.